All right, hope I don't stun you all with my foolishness here this evening. Uh, most of you all, if not everyone, could be teaching this class instead of me. So thank you, and thanks to Ed Babcock uh, and Dennis Howard, who more or less are the contemplative servant leaders for the front porch here at St. John's here in Tallahassee. And our motto here at St. John's is wherever you are on your spiritual journey, you're welcome here. So thank you for being with us. Uh, I think, uh, Ed, I'm ready if you are, if you want to do the first slide and I'll go from there. Okay, I will. Uh, just a reminder, folks, um, if you're not going to be participating, if you could mute yourself just so we don't get any extraneous noise. So I thank you for that and uh, we'll move forward. Uh, go back one slide. There we uh, go. Back one slide, Ed. There we go. Thank you. Um, so I've said thanks to uh, Ed and Dennis, but I also need to say thank you to my daughter, Rebecca, who did the uh, PowerPoint for me. I'm I'm old school, and for us, it's usually in person or without PowerPoint. But I think it works better over Zoom. So tonight's talk is about the Christian spiritual journey. Uh, this afternoon, I was hoping Ed or Dennis was going to call me and say, "Oops." Zoom isn't working because this is a big topic to talk about in about an hour. So what I hope to do is to do um, about 10 minutes per slide. We'll leave about 30 minutes or more uh, to talk about your own journeys, any questions, to share some things. Um, we're gonna be covering about 2000 years of Christian spiritual history here. In an hour, it's kind of like Mel Brooks, you know, history of the world, part one. Uh, I did a class maybe 15 years ago at St. John's. It was during Lent. Um, and it was um, a six weeks class, one hour at night. And I used. Um, it seems a little better. Honey. Cunningham's and Egan's book on uh, Christian spirituality. I'm not They're both. That. I, just, you know, I think I'm, I'm getting some feedback from someone. Thank you. Yeah, if you could mute yourselves, please. Thank you. Um, so I'm not going to be talking about a lot of books tonight, but this is the book that I used about 15 years ago. Uh, they were at Notre Dame. It's a good book. You all know everything probably in this book. But after the last class, right at the last class, I started talking about some of my own experiences. And one of the men in the class who went on to become an Episcopal priest said, Dan, I wish that you had talked about your experiences more instead of giving us the book. So tonight, I'm going to do this from my heart and from my own experience or experiences. And what I hope this does is to uh, trigger in yourselves pieces of your own journey uh, because we undertake this journey all for the um, glorification of God. And, but in thanksgiving and in gratitude, uh, we lift up our spiritual journey. Uh, after the talk uh, is over, hopefully about eight o'clock, it's not gonna be that fluid. We're gonna be moving in between some of these stages. Um, we'll um, have some time for conversation. Right. What I'd li like to do is to talk with you, let you see what, uh, hear about your own journey and to see, quite frankly, if there's any interest in meeting outside of this class on Zoom uh, to do a spiritual journey Zoom talk among all of us, to talk about your own journeys, to ask questions, to share books, to share um, lectures, things like that. So if you're interested in that, you can shoot me an email to my own email account. That's Dan Dobbins, the number 10 at gmail.com, dandobbins10 at gmail.com. All right, with that in mind, Ed, we'll move to the next slide, please. I think most of you all probably recognize this painting. It's, uh, I'm using this for the invitation. Uh, it's spoken to me or it spoke to me. This is a painting by William Holman Hunt. British painter from the 1800s. This particular card that I brought back from St. Paul's Cathedral, um, he, he painted three of them. Actually, he painted this one 
in the last 50 years of his life. The first one is at uh, Oxford University. He painted a smaller one and it's in, um, um, I'm having a senior moment like William had. Uh, it's at a small church. It's at a church, maybe in Nottingham uh, in England. But this one is the largest painting and it's in St. Paul's Cathedral. And it's called the light of the world. And it took him about 50 years to complete his vision with this painting. It hangs in the Middlesex Chapel as an altarpiece in St. Paul's Cathedral. So some of you have probably been there, maybe most of you have, uh, but it's called The Light of the World and it's an allegorical painting. But Hunt says that he was commanded to do this painting. And if you look at the painting, what you see is Jesus, the light of the world is in his hand and above his head, above the halo right there is the morning star, which we also call the Christ. And he's got his right hand knocking on the door. And it's an overgrown door, which represents the overgrown door to our hearts. And if you pay particular attention to it, there's no handle on the outside. The handle is on the inside. And Hunt based this painting on Revelation 3.20. I'll come back to that in just a minute. But this painting in the 1800s was the most traveled painting in the world. And it's probably the most recognized painting of Christ during that century. Uh, Hunt died, I think, he, he did the third painting here. He used an assistant because he had glaucoma as William did, but it took me 50 years and it hangs in St. Paul's. What I like to do when I'm in London, I like to go to St. Paul's. I like to go in that side chapel. It's a huge painting. You can sit there, meditate, do your centering prayer, whatever you're called to do. But it's, um, it's spiritual really just to sit with it. Uh, and it sits to the left as you face the main sanctuary. So, Revelation 3.20 is the scripture that this painting is based on. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and have a meal with you side by side. It's a wonderful piece of scripture for, for, for Thomas Keating. It was Matthew, what, 6.6, 6, go into your inner room. For many, it's uh, Psalm 46.10, be still and know that I am God. Um, but for me, that painting speaks to me, as it does thousands of people. So it's left up to us to undertake this journey, and we begin the journey uh, through this invitation. I've called it an invitation, but so many of us know it as the call, right? Um, I'd like to read uh, this from, um, this is a great book. I got it years and years ago, early in my journey. It's called The Inner Journey, Views from the Christian Tradition. It's by, um, it's the series by Parabola. I'm going to read just a few paragraphs from um, the gifts of the call, which are synonymous with the invitation. The call to metanoia, transformation or repentance, comes to us in different ways. Yet we must all at some point hit bottom and vow to change our lives. The ego crashes, a light greater than the ego breaks through the isolation and separation we have created. Called to a different way of knowing and being, we begin to read as if for the first time. 
We do not read for information, but to know ourselves and be changed. We want to know where we have come from, where we are, and where we are going. We are called to a new interiority, a new solitude, and a new kind of community. As we are called, we realize the reality of the invisible world. For we are called home, and home is not exclusively an earthly place, but more than what, but more like what Paul calls the community of saints, a body that encompasses both the living and the so-called dead. So sometimes we're given a second opportunity on the call, right? And what this call brings to us is, by the way, what I want to mention to us too, is this spiritual journey presupposes what Richard Rohr calls the container. That's our faith, that's our church, that's our uh, verbal prayers, that's um, our service to the poor, to the needy, whatever we've done with our lives to get to this point, this spiritual journey assumes that as the container, okay? But this is an invitation to wake up. What the melody calls awareness, what other call, what people call inner awareness. So for me, I got the call at age 35. You could hear it, I knew it, but I wasn't ready to open that door to the spiritual journey. I wasn't quite awake yet. But, and we come to this journey, as most of us know, either through great suffering or through great love. Most of us come to it through great suffering. That was the door that I stepped through. And for me at age 50, I was going through what St. John calls one of those dark nights of the soul, St. John of the Cross, right? The ego was powerless to resolve my distress, my suffering. I'll never forget I was upstairs in my room on my knees begging for what the early Israelites begged for when they were on their own pilgrimage in the desert. They said, take us back to Egypt, back to slavery, back, give us the flesh pots of Egypt. Forget this journey stuff, it's too much pain. But you see, the ego is helpless to solve what needs to be solved. All we can do is to let go. And you know, when I was at the University of Florida, we had a lot of statues, just like many campuses do, for all the leaders of the campus, you know, back in their day, and, and you've been to Washington, you've seen all these statues. Well, I was encapsulated in this, in this cast iron, right? But because of that suffering was too great, and I was begging for mercy, God heard me. And here's what God made known to me. And here comes some of my own spiritual experiences, which I hope recalls your own. And some of mine, I think, are universal in nature. God made known to me these words. Is that all you want from your life? Let me show you what life can be like in me. Kaboom, a thunderbolt of divine love. My whole being, my whole soul was overtaken by divine love. You can't describe this, you can't write about it, you can't really tell about it, but you know from your own spiritual experiences what I'm referencing. From that minute onward, I made the turn to the inner journey. Next slide, please, Ed. Surrender to the unknown marks the great transitions of the spiritual journey. 
that's uh, from Thomas Keating. I picked up that card in 2003 when I was attending a contemplative outreach um, international conference in Houston. And the featured speaker at that conference was Thomas Keating and Richard Rohr. That night, after that spiritual experience for me when I was age 50, 1999, I dedicated myself to the spiritual journey. I was in hook, line, and sinker. I attended silent retreats. Retreats. I went. I started at the Monastery of Christ in the Desert in um, Abiquiu, New Mexico. I found my way ultimately to uh, Snowmass, where many of you have been with Thomas Keating and uh, Abbot Joseph Boyle. I mentioned, eventually met Thomas or met Father William Menninger. But what happens, I think, is the Holy Spirit sees that we're serious about this. So we undertake our response. And it includes a lot of things under the discipline, which we're gonna talk about. And remember that each of these phases, at least in my own experience, perhaps in your own, there's a fluidity to it. You know, it's not like hopscotch where you go from one to the other, right? It's fluid. And sometimes we go back, you know, one step forward, two steps backwards. But the scripture to me that speaks to me on the response is, you set your hand to the plow, an agrarian metaphor from Jesus, you set your hand to the plow and you don't look back. There was no looking back for me. I'm sure there's been no looking back for you because Christ holds the pearl of great price. He holds that treasure hidden in the field. And that's this journey is discover that pearl of great price and that hidden treasure in the field. Now, part of my response is, and you know, on our response, the Holy Spirit guides us and takes us where we're to go. Because at some point, the Holy Spirit sees we're serious about the journey. And I'll say this maybe a few times, but the reasons that we do this response, we undertake the disciplines, is to cultivate a heart of responsiveness, right? It's like dating. You start out dating and eh, you might be friends, you might be friends, but you kind of keep taking some steps forward until you say to the other or the other says to you, I kind of like this. You want to go deeper. And the response takes us deeper. If we're faithful to the journey, it's faithful to us. Um, I was having, I came the way of Teresa of Avila to begin with. Teresa of Avila came the way of exuberant mysticism, spiritual experiences galore. St. John of the Cross, the other great Spanish mystic, came the way of the backward uh, of the uh, dark staircase, right? Well, initially, mine was these exuberant experiences. God was loving me. I felt like I was the betrothed. And there's nothing like this, right? To be the focal point of God's attention and love. But a lot of it was a little bit scary. And I had a men's Bible study here made at my house for 10 years. Two of my friends in that Bible study um, helped me. There were, there were people that I could call on when I, when I got in trouble, when I didn't know where I was going. Because sometimes you don't. The spirit takes you places that you've never been before. So I was headed to Paris with my oldest daughter, Courtney, in New York City. After college, she'd moved there and um, sought her own, her own career. So I flew up there, 
spent the night at her apartment. And I'm going to share this with you because I think it's universal as well. We're flying to Paris the next day. I wake up that morning, going to have lunch with my brother, going to meet her at the airport later at JFK. That morning, I wake up to this dream. And here is my dream. And dream work is important to the journey. We'll talk about that under the disciplines in a minute. I was standing face to face with the great Swiss psychiatrist, Carl Jung, Carl Jung, Carl Jung. He had his three-piece suit on, he had his pipe. We were looking eyeball to eyeball. I was closely, I was just standing close right to him. And he says to me these words in my dream, quo vadis, the Latin for where are you going? He spoke to me in Latin, quo vadis, where are you going? Isn't that, isn't that a universal truth? Where are you going on your spiritual journey? Where are we going? I should have known things were gonna happen that day, but, I, but you know, it wasn't really, it wasn't there, but I was aware of what had happened that morning. That afternoon, I'm meeting my brother at his office on Broadway at Random House to go to lunch. I'm there at his office. He gets tied up at a meeting. He says, Dan, wait in here, you know, pull, pull some books off the bookshelf if you like. I pulled a book off the bookshelf. I opened it up to these words. Grace will not take you where grace cannot sustain you. Grace will not take you where grace cannot sustain you. For those who've come this way of exuberant or ecstatic mysticism, what a great comfort that was. Because much like Peter, much like Paul, much like the early disciples, I didn't know where I was going, you know. Via de la Rosa one time, maybe with Jesus. Um, uh, what's the, the um, Agapian way there where Peter goes to Rome, you know, and meets Jesus as he's leaving Rome because of the persecutions. And Jesus says to him, this is after Jesus's crucifixion, resurrection. He says to Peter, where are you going? Jesus was running from his anointment, from his spiritual journey. And he turns around that minute and goes back to Rome, and becomes a martyr. Tradition has it, he was hanged upside down as St. Paul was because he didn't want to be hung like Jesus because he was undeserving. Well, that's at noontime. That evening, I meet Courtney out at JFK. We're boarding the plane. And we're at the front of the line for some reason. And the flight attendant says to me, what seat do you have? And I looked at my ticket and I said, 2B, the numeric to the letter B. And the day rushed over me. And I said to her, and I turned around to the crowd behind me, I said, to be or not to be, that is the question. And I, of course, I'm in Kairos time, right? I've been in Kairos time and Kronos time throughout the day, but I was squarely in, in Kairos time, heavenly time. And I said to the people behind me, I've had this most incredible day. And I repeated what had just happened to me throughout the day. And a voice, from a woman back in the crowd says, the universe is trying to tell you something. <laughs> well, God was trying to tell me something, right? That day with those three messages, quo vadis, grace will sustain you. And what are you called to be? I think that's true for each and every one of us. And that's why I've elected to share this, this story with you and invite you to think about how this story enters into your search for Christ, 
into the search for the larger self. Uh, Ed, let's go to the next slide, please, the journey. Obviously a picture of modern day Jerusalem. I'm going to back to a quote to William Hilton. William Hilton was a mystic in the 14th century. For those of you who are friends and close friends and been to Father William's retreats, have heard him speak of Walter Hilton. Hilton was a contemporary of Julian. He lived in the 14th century in England. Remember the plague has swept through England two or three times, major and minor plagues, sort of like the coronavirus is sweeping around the world now. No vaccines, they didn't know where it was coming from. But I um, reached out to um, one of my friends today, uh, Joe McCann, who's been Mertonized. And I'll talk about Joe in a minute. But I couldn't remember Carl um, uh, Coleman's. Was it McCollman, Carl Coleman, Carl McCollman? But I read this. He said, Yes, that's correct. It, Carl, Carl uh, Coleman or McCollman? McCollman, right? Yep, okay. Yes. Um, thanks, Joe. What, what, it's nice to, and I remember William talking about this. I'm going to refer to, Will to William as, William Manager, everybody knows who William Manager is. If they don't, they will by the time this evening is through. Because uh, I don't know who all is on the talk. And I was trying to look to see how I could tailor my talk and see who was on the talk. But you'll just have to pardon me. Thank you. Uh, Joe's put that in the chat box. Carl McCollman. He says that Walter Hillman, uh, Hilton was to Julian of Norwich and the anonymous cloud or the anonymous author of The Cloud of Unknowing, he was to them what um, um, George Harrison was to John Lennon and Paul McCartney. <laughs> he was kind of a star in his own way, but he was overshadowed by those two. So Walter Hilton was like that. And isn't it fun? I remember William talking, said, wouldn't it be fun to know that if Hilton actually saw Julian or visited the anonymous author of the cloud, the kind of things we'd like to talk about. You know, it's, um, uh, so when you're on the journey, you know, you talk about the um, goddess of things. So um, here, here's what William said. And here's the quote. When, when pilgrims, be going to Jerusalem. That's their spiritual pilgrimage is to go to Jerusalem 14th century, right? We're on our way to Jerusalem. We've been there. Um, some of us have been there, some not, but we're headed to the new Jerusalem on this journey, on this spiritual journey. But whenever he went to them, and Ed, did you mind put the quote back up for me, please? I'm gonna deviate here if you don't mind just a little bit. Put up Walter Hilton's quote, please. And I'll talk around it. Thank you, Ed. Whenever pilgrims went to see Walter Hilton for spiritual direction at, before they left for Jerusalem, remember they're in England, they're headed to Jerusalem, not an easy journey in the uh, uh, 1400 or 1300s. He said these words. And I can hear William saying these words to me, perhaps he's done this on his retreats. And friends, these words make us the richest people in the world. That's William speaking, not Dan. He would, Walter Hilton would tell the pilgrims, have ever in your heart and frequently upon your lips, I am nothing, I have nothing, I desire nothing, 
but the love of Christ. Thank you, Ed, we can go back. There are plenty of writers you all know uh, that have spoken about the journey. Uh, we don't have time tonight to go into those. Uh, I know that, that you know them. We talked about the Spanish mystics before. Um, one thing I do wanna to say to you that came, that came to me, that was given to me. Um, of course, you know about Keating's books. He's got the spiritual journey tapes. Uh, you can find those on YouTube. There's about 30 of those or more of those on YouTube. Whenever you go on retreats at Snowmass, the first two retreats were designed for silence, for centering prayer, um, and to look at those spiritual journey tapes that, uh, that Thomas Keating had done. Uh, you've got Merton. I told you about my friend Joe McCann. He's been Mertonized. Uh, he's been to Merton's Cottage. Uh, his hermitage, his uncle was with Merton. Um, so please reach out to Joe if you have any questions about Merton, because that's who I reach out to. Um, you've got Roar. Uh, he's got the journey, order, disorder, reorder. Um, you've got Keating's trilogy, you know, invitation to love. Uh, 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 the Eucharist as, uh, as a spiritual journey. And what was the other one I'm drawing? It was the first one. Um, uh, Centering Prayer. Somebody help me here. You all know the first book of uh, Thomas's. Okay. Um, uh, if most of you know Ken Wilbur, his spiritual diet. Dynamics you have about waking up. Uh, Georgia says I'm frozen. Okay, I've got, I'm looking over here at my Wi Fi. I've got full Wi Fi. Thank you. We can see you moving, Pam. Okay, good. Okay, thanks. So I do want to read this and we'll move on to the next slide. And this is coming back to the article uh, that was written by Christopher Banford, The Gift of the Call that I mentioned earlier. I don't know, it's a great book for your library if you don't have it. Answering the call, one becomes a seeker. following the call. Grace teaches that the call, though it takes different forms, is always one. To realize the unity of creation, the non-duality of reality, and therefore, or thereby, to transfigure the world. We seek and we are found. We call and we are called. We give and we are given. We study, we form groups, we meditate, we pray. All this is good, but the heart of the matter lies elsewhere. There is only one universe, one search, one call, one love, one gift. Returning it in the form of the gift of ourselves, we recover not only what we have lost, but the seed of the world yet to come. Then the way is clear and simple. Chosen from the foundation of the world, we are called to the praise of the glory of God's grace. Uh, next slide, please, Ed. Yeah. 
Thank you. And thank you friends for being here with my hoarseness. It's a, um, something I've struggled with here for a while. I've written down these disciplines. Of course, there are lots more to add to it. You have your own. Um, if I were gonna add some more, it would certainly be uh, dreams. It's an important part of my own journey. It's an important part of yours, I'm sure. But Lectio Divina was the traditional way. Grigor II, right? Uh, writing, what was it? Um, he wrote about Lectio Divina, the four movements of Lectio Divina, the heartfelt reading of scripture. Uh, you know, you got your candle there in the morning, you got your Bible there. You know, it's five o'clock, 4.30 in the morning, just you and the Lord, and you're, you're deep into the movement of Lectio Divina. Hang on, right? Mr. Toad's wild ride. Uh, centering prayer. Wh why is centering prayer important? From Thomas Keating, because centering prayer, the meditation, there's nothing you can do wrong but not do it. But the gift of centering prayer is the unloading of the unconscious. The Enneagram, Father Menninger, when he was in Jerusalem in the 90s teaching uh, the Myers-Briggs, someone taught him the Enneagram. He went to uh, a talk on that. He set aside the uh, Myers-Briggs, learned the Enneagram in the 90s and undertook teaching the Enneagram. And two things he says about the Enneagram. The Enneagram teaches us true, true humility. What is true humility? The truth about ourselves. And the truth about ourselves will set us free. And he used to say that the Enneagram is the journey, whereas the Myers-Briggs was the destination. Uh, process of forgiveness, of course, that's important. William's got a great book on the process of forgiveness. Kathy Walker, uh, who was an assistant to a rector at St. John's, is going to be given a Lenten talk in March. She'll be the uh, March featured, feature, featured speaker for the front porch. She'll be given a talk on forgiveness. And I forgot to bring William's book. I think it's chapter six. If you have William's book, on the process of forgiveness. I believe it's chapter six or chapter seven. If you'll read that chapter, what you're entitled to. What you're entitled to, important chapter in the book. And then the last chapter in the book is his compassion meditation that you pray for the three people. We don't have time to go into all of that tonight, but that's certainly an important part. The welcoming prayer, uh, Mary, um, Mikowski, who's now dead, that's where you um, are taught to um, accept what's given you, to welcome it, to bring it in, have a dialogue with it in yourself, recognize what's happening. You welcome the distress, the anxiety, uh, the anger, the guilt, the shame, whatever is going on, you welcome it, you, you recognize it, you say, oh, my old friend, come on in, let's have a long period around my living room. And at some point, it's time to let it go. And, and you let it go back to Christ, to the universe. And we give up our need to control that. There's a lot of people have been on retreats here, silent retreats, other retreats. A lot happens on retreats. I'm preaching to the choir now. Uh, Joe McCann, by the way, on, on this talk, uh, you have an excellent um, presentation on retreats. That's at St. John's Coffee Talks. I think that's at our website. Uh, and Joe, why don't you put in there where you might be able to find your talk. It's an excellent one on retreats. Of course, solitude, uh, the uh, spiritual direction, having spiritual friends with you along the way, uh, spiritual friendships, journaling, fasting, uh, not only from food, but fasting from, from whatever attracts us, you know, whatever distracts us from the spiritual journey. When you I was leaving, Snowmass, when I refer to Snowmass, I'm referring to St. Benedict's Monastery, as most of you know. And uh, one of the gifts I found there was this book. Okay, Ed, will you uh, leave the screen, please? Thank you. 
we just go back to the full screen. Here's another book that I picked up on the way out. And on our journey, doesn't the Holy Spirit bring us uh, the books we need, the people we need? Uh, the Buddha says uh, the teacher will appear when the student is ready for it. But this is a wonderful book on simplicity. Richard Foster talks a lot about simplicity, the Quaker writer. Uh, he's got a book on spiritual classics that I'm sure most of you are familiar with. But this is a wonderful book on journeys of simplicity. It's by um, Philip Harden, H-A-R-D-E-N. It's just one or two page stories about what other spiritual pilgrims had, what was found with them at the time of their death. It's a wonderful book. It's, I commend it to, to you uh, for your library. Um, let's see. And, re, and I think we all know this as well. The disciplines are there. It's the finger pointing to the moon, right? But the finger pointing to the moon is not the moon. But it does, the disciplines do cultivate that receptivity to being present to the present moment, to being present to what God is bringing us during that moment. Um, and there comes a point in the journey too um, where it changes, you know, uh, at least for me it did. You know, you, you go from being the, um, the betrothed, uh, the favorite lover, to having the rug pulled out from underneath you. Uh, it's what Finley says, uh, Jim Finley says, God has gone into a cave, right? And whereas before he was the song of songs, the lover in the song of songs, such intimacy. Um, but sometimes he'll run out and tap you on the shoulder to let you know he's still there. Because at the end of the day, God is bringing us to a new understanding of who God is, right? It's about nothing, 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 nothing. As I stood on my front porch at 3 a.m. in the morning on a very dark morning, grieving the loss of my lover, the Lord, the divine lover, and it being given to me, are you saying it's about nothing, no thing? no attachments it's the call to silence it's the call we're fortunate to meeting god where god is and who god is so everything is a grace right it's all grace we can't command it um Ed, I think I'm ready for the um, the next slide, please. And we're... Thank you. The sending. What's mine to do? It's um, I've stolen this. Not stolen. I borrowed it from Richard Rohr and the Living School. Uh, most of you all know the Living School. Some of you have attended. I was fortunate to go. Um, I was in the class of uh, 2017 to 19. They don't call us graduates. Uh, they call us sendees. Uh, they bring you in from off the street. They give you two years of contemplative spirituality. You get to great, read the great writers. You just have small groups and a wonderful program but the last um the last three or four months of that two-year program are writing a paper and figuring out what's mine to do what's yours to do so god doesn't take me for my selfishness otherwise it would just be narcissism right to be called in to, to this metanoia to be changed, right? Uh, to be called to uh, become the richest people on earth. 
to be called to this inward journey. It's pure narcissism if it's just for ourselves. God calls us in to heal us, to teach us, and to send us back out into to the world and what Richard Rohr calls joining our suffering with the suffering of the world. Every time we do centering prayer, we're joining the suffering of the world. We're joining all it, that is, all past, present, future, chronos, you know, time. So I think here for this evening is, and this is a universal truth too, all of you are servants. You're taking what you've been given, the special gift of the spiritual journey, and you're returning it to God, right? Because it isn't ours, it's only ours to share. And I think that that sending changes over time. Uh, in fact, um, I was deep into the journey as at Snowmass, and when you're on your um, silent retreats out there, and, and I can't see who here is on, the, is on the call, but I commend you to doing a silent retreat. Go to Snow Mass. It's a special place. Contemplative Outreach of Colorado organizes those. They set up the talks. They set up the food. They'll pick you up. Uh, if you want to go on your own retreat, you'll go through Snow Mass itself to retreats and set up your own. But if you haven't been to Snow Mass, get the... Um, uh, to the monastery from Shakespeare, right? Instead of a nunnery, same thing. Um, what I wanted to go back to and talk about the journey, it seems like the journey changes over time too. And I think what God is doing is, is polishing us. When I saw Keating one time for spiritual direction, I was deep into the journey. I told him some stories. And he said, Dan, you've been invited to the great banquet feast. Do you know how you want to serve? I didn't know what the great banquet feast was. I was just enjoy sitting at the table being fed, you know. Uh, and I didn't know what I was to do. I, like yourselves, I'd done the church work, right? The service, the teachings, the, uh, the service, that stuff. But it's being called here to take out what we've been given on the spiritual journey, to return it in some capacity to the world. It wasn't for 10 years, eight years, that I didn't meet Father William Menninger. And I met him eight or, well, I don't know, I've been on, on the inner journey now for about 21 years. I didn't meet William until 10 or 11 years into my journey. I don't know what's gonna come next, after this, uh, you know, after my time with William, we just had the first anniversary of his death, his celebration. Uh, but for yourselves, I invite you to ask yourself, what's mine to do? What have I been given to do? Uh, and if I could just go back, I'm looking here at the time uh, on, the, um, on the journey. Uh, William Menninger, Father Menninger had a great ox herding pictures for the spiritual journey. Thanks, Ed. Well, we'll go back one more for the journey. If you'll find the ox herding pictures for William Menninger, that's at his uh, YouTube website. That's a great paradigm for the journey uh, that I forgot to mention. Uh, and I think, thanks, Ted. We'll just go back to, uh, to the full screen. Let me look at my notes. And I think that uh, that will conclude my talk for the evening. I think now we'll open it up um, for, for questions, for thoughts, for comments. But I do want to um, ask you all if anyone would be interested in forming a Zoom group at some point. Uh, on talking about the spiritual journey. We can talk about that at some point. You can send me that email. But I do want to thank you for your time. 
Thank you for your companionship along the way. That's my term for the journey. I don't know, I borrowed it from someone, I'm sure, along the way. I've met many of you along the way. It's been a great gift for me to have met you and to share your journey. And thank you here this evening for letting me uh, do this quick review um, of the uh, spiritual journey, the contemplative journey. I think we can open it up now to uh, chat if anyone has any questions. If anyone wants their money back, they can see Ed or see Dennis. I think they're giving full refunds here this evening. Ed, do you want to stop the recording now? I do. So I am going to stop the recording now.